I've been spending a lot of time um, in my mother's house, finding things, sometimes things that she had been searching and searching for and not found. Brush in the rag bucket. Down in the rag bucket, layers of worn cloth, t-shirts, her blue, flannel sheets, moss green, cut into rectangles, ready to hand. I found, reaching deep into epochs of rag not come to light for years, that old brush designed for sweeping grit off castings at her father's iron foundry. A gift from folks in the office what she'd asked for, its bristles soft but sturdy, carried into her marriage to the soldier hero who'd come back skin and bone and broken in spirit but alive, who stood smiling, proud, and baffled long as he could. When the brush disappeared, she keened, felt abandoned once more, thrilled to hold it. I headed for the chair she'd occupied toward the end, forgetting no place to find and tell her, but in my heart, nothing to do but use it and be glad. Most evenings he would sing and play his banjo. And many of those evenings I'd be right there at his feet. Until he told me it was time for me to go home. And this is the way he'd sell it. Time to take my banjo and put it on the shelf. If you want to hear any more, you have to play it yourself. Always had a great big smile on his face, a tooth in every other space, a grand hello, an old banjo in the corner on a stand. It didn't take that much to coax a song from the old man's throat. I love that music, and I love that man. He'd sing. You ought to see my Cindy, she lives away down south. She's so sweet, the honey bees swarm around her mouth. Last time I saw him, he leaned his hoe up against the barn, reached out to take my arm. In his blistered grasp, I could read the past in every callus on his hands. In his world of earth and rust, his clothes filled with dust and that dust spilled out in the music of the man. Cindy got religion, happened once before. But when I play my banjo, she's the first one on the floor. That banjo had a broken string. I think it had been that way since spring. Still it had a tone like a polished stone, smoothed by a thousand hands. It had a high and lonesome sound, firmly rooted in the ground and woven through the music of that man. And when I die, as surely everybody will, that ringing of my banjo will echo through these hills. It's old fashioned, they all say. How come you play that way? Don't you know they turn that page on the Nashville stage? 
but they don't understand. This is more than history. I feel it's up to me to carry on the music of that man. Time to take his banjo, pull it from the shell. He can't play it anymore. Have to play it myself. This is fabulous company to be in. You're all wonderful. Uh, we, there was a lot of talk about visuals today, and this comes from a visual image I saw and had to write about. It's called Preacher. I walked along the parish hall to go out through the church. A glance into the rector's office said it all. An empty robe belonging to our minister, the priest, the understanding counselor flung randomly abandoned on a chair faced intimately toward its reciprocal to listen or to talk. The other chair turned parenthetically, embraced a walking jacket, sturdy tweed with leather elbow patches, likewise without occupant, belonging to a father, husband, lay citizen, and shed quickly for another role. I and the pastor had just had a brief, hurried, genuine conversation about Swedish cars and their reliability. I and this man of business, faith, family, and politics, whose two cloaks I chanced upon. I wonder how much his time, his busy shouldering of lives, allows to spend in slow, careful contemplation of his flock's concerns, other than an urgent threat to life or matters metaphysical. Do terrors lurk for him beneath small words? Please, do you have a minute? I wonder if, it may not be a problem. I didn't mean to bother. Maybe you can't understand. Can any of us truly offer comfort unto whom from within the highly decorated, well-insulated, socially heralded, cocoon we call our church. Alas, he represents us to ourselves. Thank you. Um, so I grew up in uh, California, and um, my parents uh, were New Englanders. So that was a little weird sometimes. <laughs> and uh, this, this uh, poem is called Alienation. Our home already an oasis in the noisy neighborhood. It's even quieter here in the basement. Gordon's old bedroom, now mine. The light comes through a rectangular window in the left corner, casting clear across brown shag carpet, alighting the mural. Autumn woods in reds and yellows. Nothing in California resembles these woods. They remind me of those in my illustrated Walden Pond, Thoreau's writing combined with kitschy photos, a wallpaper version of that. Stage right in the corner is my drafting table with an attached light and mechanical arm, some pencils and erasers, tape and vellum. Most of it I don't need anymore. I got this all for Christmas in eighth grade, and Mr. Fritz gave me an award for my drawings. His black mustache would go from straight to slightly smiling in approval of clean drawings. Then the application, cut plywood, drill, sand, and finish. My replica of a colonial house, the boys chided me, was a dollhouse. 
In this new school, there's no wood shop, not even drawing classes either. Mom gave me a big sheet of paper, so I drew those aliens, the ones you see taped to my door. Okay, so there's two parts to it. The first part goes like this. Whoa, 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 whoa. And the second part is very similar. It goes like this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Cool, got it? Let's sing it together. One, two. One, two, whoa, 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 always ticking, ever watching, face that's on every wall, got me rushing, keeping up and further and further back, I fall now. I'm gonna fuss, you can trust them in a rush Got them to pray, they could pay for more hours a day I can barely hear the voices say Take your time Take your time There's beauty in the moments of the way Take your time Take your time. There's nothing that then you're feeling face. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who said patience is a virtue? Did they have nothing to do? On the fence with too much to choose Don't got a second to lose now I'm gonna fuss, you can trust, I'm in a rush Got them to pray, they could pay for more hours a day I can barely hear the voices say Take your time Take your time There's beauty in the moments of the way Take your time, take your time. No need for stressing when you're keeping pace. Here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so I moved to Rhode Island since the last time I was here. I wanted to be live near the sea, and it turned out to be more affordable to do so in Rhode Island than here in Massachusetts. So I could certainly relate to Lewis's song about gone to the water, and I didn't end up exactly at the, at the sea itself, but I live near the bay. I can see it from my window. Uh, it's affected, it's an extension of the sea, affected by the tides, has rhythmic movements, and seagulls. But I, uh, I didn't bring a poem from the sea, I brought a poem from a dream. It's called, it was a dream about a bridge in the sky. 
While traipsing across a bridge in the sky, a whispering came over the breeze. How did you get here? You have no wings. My answer was, I came in a dream. So I can't say how long I'll be. But I'm hoping to find that angel eye that enables one to read between the lines. Now I had that dream a few nights ago, yet the whispering breeze questions me still. Why do you insist on knowing the truth when it only alienates you? There are worse fates than alienation, I replied. With those persistent glimpses, like fleeting fairies gnawing away at your defenses, till you find yourself surmising. Perhaps there's some truth to the rumor of the light at the end of the tunnel leading to where the heretics abide. Then again, last night, I dreamed of crossing that bridge in the sky, with this time the breeze whispering coyly, no need to be in such a hurry, journeyman as there is no other side, no other side, no other side. Thank you very much. For uh, any of you who uh, do not have uh, enough gray hair to remember, many of the people in, uh, many in my generation before and for a while after learned how to read with Dick and Jane. The poem is Dick and Jane. Would Dick and Jane be just another Dick and Jane if we hadn't met them when we were small and scared, sitting in a dark, dismal schoolhouse on Nikolai Street, abandoned by our mothers to the wicked witch of the East? How we dreaded having to read about you out loud one at a time, as Miss Gulch thrust her pointer at her hearts. A few kids in our class could have been Dick or Jane. A few might even have had a dog, like Spot. They read easily, unlike Mark, who haltingly stuttered through the page as if walking on hot coals, or me whose heart became a kettle drum as I waited my turn. Yet now, as Dick and Jane turn 84 and persevere as young and cute as ever, while the rest of us have withered and creased, now I find myself grateful to you, to your vanilla friend Sally, and spot two. It took a while, but we learned to read. The dread of reading in class became the sweet pleasure of reading on our own. Jane holding Dick's hand, throwing a ball to spot, talking endlessly. Look, look, Dick, see spot run? Look, look at car. Look at the car. See the car, Sally? See the car, Spot? Look out, Spot! Oh, no, Dick. Oh, no, Spot. Poor Spot. By giving us the words, you gave us the world. Thank you, Dick and Jane. Sorry, Spot. <laughs> Checking out the groceries, I've got a hunger in my head. Feed me existentially, don't get any crumbs in bed. You've had so many crumbs in bed. I'm 
not another crumb in bed. Toast and crackers, nuts to chew. You feed me and I feed you a gustatory ecstasy. It's a little hard to sleep with crumbs in bed. They keep me up. I'm up all night. Let's dim the light. Oh, let's eat all night, eat all night, eat all night, and make a few more crumbs in bed. Eat all night, eat all night, eat all night, and make a few more crumbs in bed. Poppy bagels with cream cheese, I feed you and you feed me. Poppy seeds drop there full here, you pick one, eat it from my beard, from my beard. And don't get any crumbs in bed, you've had so many crumbs in bed. I'm not another crumb in bed. Oh, let's eat all night, eat all night, eat all night, and make a few more crumbs in bed. Eat all night, eat all night, eat all night, and make a few more crumbs in bed. Checking out the groceries, I've got a hunger in my head. Feed me existentially, we won't get any crumbs in bed. They keep me up. I'm up all night. Let's dim the light. Oh, let's eat all night, eat all night, eat all night, and make a few more crumbs in bed. Eat all night, eat all night, eat all night, and make a few more crumbs in bed. Crumbs in bed. Crumbs in bed. I'm not another crumb in bed. Thank you. Another hat that I wear is I, I'm a researcher, and sometimes I research um, about people a couple hundred years ago. So it really started me thinking, and that brought me to this new poem that's called <clears throat> We Are All the Ghosts of Tomorrow. 300 years from now, will my descendants look from my records and find all my Facebook posts, my emails, my searches? my stuff saved on the clouds, my YouTube watches, my Netflix movies. This recording that is done and the hum of computers and clouds holding on to everything, what is that all about? Millions of data, bits and pieces of a life recorded now, so when I'm a ghost, my descendants will find out who I really am. Will I appear as a hologram like Prince? DNA, fingerprints, eye recognition? How will I appear in ghostly form? Thank you. The first piece is Alone. From childhood's hour, I have not been. As others were, I have not seen. As others saw, I could not bring my passion from a common spring. From the same source I have not taken, my sorrow I could not awaken, my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Then, in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life was drawn, from every depth of good and ill, the mystery which binds me still, from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, 
From the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. And my second piece is a dream within a dream. Take this kiss upon thy brow, and in parting with you now, this much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream. In a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of the surf-torrented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep. While I weep, while I weep. O oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream. Thank you. you know, sometimes I read these short tanka, but I have a little bit longer. When uh, my parents died five years ago and my dad yeah, I had dementia, um, you know, like a lot of people do at the end of their lives, so I wrote some poems. Uh, about him. My father is like an aging sun that can't remember how to shine and keeps recycling the same old light, telling the same stories over and over. And I say, yes, Dad, yes, and I don't mind, remembering how I grew in the garden of his wisdom, remembering all the times that he didn't mind. Mm -hmm.